Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Women's History Month Leader of Professional Development and Observance. I'm your MC, LaDonna Tolbert. Please stand for the invocation given by Lieutenant Colonel Breckenridge. Would you pray with me? Lord, I come before you today with thanks and gratitude. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it are the words that remind me that today is one of many you have made, and I once again thank you. There's so much we as people take for granted, and sadly, it is the greatest resource I, in particular, sometimes neglect, and that resource is people. Help us to be intentional in our interactions, to see each person in our life, our loved ones, coworkers, and even strangers we meet on a daily basis as important. On this day in the month of March 2023 that celebrates the amazing history of women, Lord, I, I give thanks for the, the cherished women in our lives and all throughout history, mothers, sisters, friends, and neighbors. Lord, I thank you specifically for the blessings I and others have received and experienced working alongside and for women of all faiths and walks of life. May you continue to empower women in their work, specifically here at BAMSI, the nurses, doctors and surgical staff, behavioral health professionals, pediatricians, radiology or emergency medicine technicians, janitorial services, administrative assistants, cooks, chefs, commanders at each leadership echelon, and the many other specialists. Lord, grant them wisdom and strength to advance their individual and organizational mission. May we commemorate and encourage the vital role women have and continue to have in American history. I ask all this in your most holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Colonel Breckenridge. Thank you all for joining us today to celebrate inspiring women in history who have also served in the military as we observe this month's theme of celebrating women who tell our stories. We would like to recognize our distinguished guest, General Retired Vincent Brooks, former commander of the United Nations Command, Combined Forces Command, and United States Forces Korea. Mr. Joseph Bray, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, Texas South. Colonel Retired Tia Benning, former commander of the 106th Signal Command, and Michael Matthews, Army Support Activity Deputy Manager. We'd also like to welcome all leaders, coworkers, family, and friends. We hope that you enjoy the discussion. At this time, I'd like to welcome Colonel Heather Yoon, Brook Army Medical Center Deputy Commander for Medical Services for our opening remarks. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to all of you for being here, to our distinguished visitors, to our panelists, to our audience, including all of you out there in Facebook land. Uh, initially, I was planning on being here on my own behalf. Uh, I'm the Deputy Commander for Medical Services. I'm also the Command Liaison for our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion team. Um, and then General Tan, who unfortunately is greatly disappointed to not be able to be here, asked me to be here uh, on her behalf. Later on, I found she pre-recorded a video, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. So I'm gonna let her be actually on her own behalf again. <laughs> and I'm gonna be back to Heather Yoon. Um, I'm so excited and really just grateful to be able to have this opportunity to recognize um, this event, you know, the adage about if we, don't, if we don't explore history, if we don't learn history, then we have the opportunity to repeat it many times. Um, and just to be inspired and be able to reflect on um, three amazing uh, journeys of uh, general officers. You know, my own women's history experience as a junior major when I had served my um, HPSP commitment and was trying to figure out whether to make the military career and looking around and trying to see, well, I have great mentors, but who out there is like me? Who looks like me? Who is a mom and a wife and a doctor and a leader and all of this? And I really couldn't find anyone actually. And that wasn't so long ago. Um, so if you're out there, now you'll know someone, <laughs> okay? You'll know someone who is a general officer who did it. Um, so uh, with all of that, thanks again for being here, and I'm gonna ask for the video clip of General Tan to be rolled. Good morning and welcome to our Women's History Month panel. I really wish I could be here in person, but the Army had other plans for me today. 
I look forward to watching the event online. As we celebrate Women's History Month, it's important to reflect on the contributions of women in the field of military medicine. For centuries, women have played a vital role in providing medical care to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and now guardians. Their selfless service and dedication to the well-being of our troops have been instrumental in shaping the course of our nation's history. Throughout history, women have faced many challenges when it comes to serving in the military. They had to fight for the right to serve and to be recognized for their contributions. Despite the obstacles they faced, women persevered and made significant contributions to the field of military medicine. As just a few examples, during the Civil War, Dr. Mary Edwards Walker became the first female U.S. Army surgeon. Countless other women played a critical role as nurses and provided invaluable medical care to service members on the battlefield. They risked their lives to provide essential medical care to those in need. Today, we truly stand on the shoulders of giants as women continue to serve in all areas of military medicine, from combat medic to nurses to surgeons and researchers. They bring unique perspectives and skills to the field and are essential to the success of military healthcare system. I'm missing out on this opportunity to be up on stage today with our three inspiring guest speakers, retired Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham, retired Major General Jimmy Keenan, and Brigadier General Janine Ryder. I can't thank you enough for your participation in this important observance as we celebrate the inspiring and impressive history of women in our nation. Please enjoy this amazing event. Thank you, General Tan and Colonel Yoon for your remarks. The reading of the proclamation is one of the first occasions when communities have an opportunity to come together and reflect on the moment in our history when women pioneers were formally and nationally recognized. At this time, we'll have Lieutenant Colonel Vega read the proclamation. Good morning, teams. Good morning, leaders. City of San Antonio. Proclamation. Whereas in 1987, the Congress of the United States established the month of March as National Women History Month to recognize the importance of women and to honor their extraordinary contributions to history, culture, and society. And whereas American women of every race, ethnicity, and background have pledged a have played a historical role in leadership, not only securing their own rights of freedom, suffrage, and equal opportunity, but also supporting other movements in creating a more fair, just, and inclusive society for all. And whereas women have played and continue to play a critical economic, cultural, and social role in every sphere of the life of the nation by constituting a significant portion of the labor force working inside and outside the home. And with us, this, year, this year's theme, Celebrating Women Who Tell Our Stories, honors women, past and present, and who, and continue to tell our stories and recognizes how women's stories expand our understanding and strengthening our connections with each other. And now, therefore, I, Ron Nirenberg, mayor of the city of San Antonio, in recognition thereof, do hereby proclaim March 2023 to be Women's History Month in San Antonio, Texas, and offer best wishes to Brooke Army Medical Center. In witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of San Antonio to be affixed this 22nd day of March 2023. Ron Nienberg, Mayor of San Antonio, Texas. Thank you, Colonel Vega. Dr. Jefferson will now introduce our guest panelist. Thank you, Captain Tolbert. Good afternoon. I'm the president of the San Antonio Rocks Incorporated. We're a nonprofit veteran service organization, and I'm honored to introduce today's guest panelist. If I can have Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham come up to the stage, please. General Bingham is a U.S. Army three-star retired general who currently serves as the chair of the Blue Star Family's Board of Directors. General Bingham is a native of Troy, Alabama, an alumnus of the University of Alabama's 
Army ROTC program, which she graduated as a distinguished military graduate. She grew up during the 60s and 70s where the civil rights movement were shaping our nation. So General Bingham, she spent most of her armor career being a forerunner, a front runner, and trailblazer, serving as either the first woman or first African American to hold both that position as a general officer. She's also the only second African American woman to ever be a three-star general in the Army. So some of these positions, the Army's 51st Quartermaster General and Commandant of the U.S. Army Quartermaster School, Commanding General of the White Sands Missile Range, and Commanding General of Tank, Automotive, and Armament Life Cycle Management Command. She culminated her 38 years of service in her final assignment as the Headquarters Department of Army Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management at the Pentagon. As chair of the Blue, Fam of Blue Star Families Board of Directors, she's committed to empower military veterans and families to thrive and, as they serve. With more than 150 members in their network all over the world, Blue Star Families touches more than 1.5 million families each year. General uh, Bingham is an advocate for women and families and has led the Blue Star Families Racial Equity and Inclusion Initiative helping families military families of color to find support and training, they need to diversify their leadership in military communities. If you've read General Bingham's bio, you already know she's had a phenomenal career and continues to be a trailblazer and a servant leader. What makes General Bingham a transformational leader is that she leads deeply with her head, her heart, and her hands. Can I please have General, Major General Jimmy Keenan come to the stage? General Jimmy Keenan is a U.S. Army retired two-star general, currently serving as the Senior Vice President for Enterprise Clinic Operations at WellMade, where she oversees more than 400 owned op and operated clinics throughout Texas and Florida. General Keenan is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, as well as membership, revenue, and market growth across that enterprise. Prior to this role, General Keenan, Major General Keenan, served as Deputy Commanding General for the U.S. Army Medical Command and Chief of the U.S. Army Nurse Corps. <laughs> she also is a tremendous trailblazer, and I will say that she distinguished herself as a military graduate at Henderson State University in Arkansas, where she earned her nursing degree, so who a nurse corps. She's also, like I said, served for over 30 years as an experienced leader in healthcare administration and operations. At this time, I'd welcome Brigadier General Janine Ryder. She is a U.S. Air Force one-star general who currently serves as the commander of the 59th Medical Wing, Market Director of San Antonio Military Health System at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland, Texas. She also serves as Chief of the Nurse Corps in the, in the Air Force. Prior to this assignment, Brigadier General Ryder previously served as commander of the 7th 11th Human Performance Wing. So what does that mean? She leads the Air Force Medical Service's largest healthcare, medical education, and readiness platform which is comprised of more than 8,000 military and civilian personnel working in scientific and technical specialties that provide high quality, safe, and reliable medical care to more than 255,000 local beneficiaries here in Texas and worldwide with greater than 300 appointments annually. She is a very distinguished and female trailblazer. As an alumnus of Boston College, she is highly decorated and accomplished officer with a distinguished history. So culminating with 30 years of um, um, service, she's also the first female commander of two Air Force wings. This is very significant. And, <laughs> and also the first female commander at Keesler Medical Center. So if you read her bio, you probably already know she's also phenomenal. Um, she had a phenomenal career and also earned numerous degrees. And so I actually worked for 7th 11th Human Performance Wing as a researcher, and so what I got to experience from working with her indirectly is that she's a transformative leader because she's passionate about what she does. She has a lot of positive energy and she's all about people. So let me, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming all our three panelists.
thank you, Dr. Jefferson, for the introductions. We would like this event to be interactive, so at any time, please stand and we'll bring the mic to you for questions and comments. Okay, General Ryder, we will start with you. <laughs> please share with us your journey as a woman in the military. It's pretty broad. It's pretty broad. It's very broad. Um, so I think I came in like most people come in. We're going to do one tour. Um, I went to school two hours from home. I was like, oh, I'll get some clinical care and maybe some separation from my family. Um, I love you, Mom, if you're out there on Facebook Live <laughs> and Dad. Um, and so then what I found is that I really love the mission. I love the people. I love the um, order and discipline of this. I was very fortunate. Um, I was raised by a mom. She probably was very traditional at the time. She went to college. She was a teacher. She had me, and she stayed home. And so she raised three young um, daughters who thought they could do anything they wanted in the world. And so we did sports. I played soccer. I played baseball until um, the baseball got too fast, and I couldn't hit the ball, and it was a danger. And so then I had to go to softball. Um, and so my mom made us tough, and she made us detailed. Um, I can mow a lawn. I had an acre. My sister had an acre. My other sister had an acre. And so my parents really raised us with great work ethic, and that really kind of works in the military. And so I will say is that people ask me, what do I think about my first? You know, the first at Keesler, the first at 7-Eleven, the first at, and um, that makes me uncomfortable. Because I, I don't, I don't, the attention is not about me. However, I think it, we have to show that there is a journey for anybody that you can see yourself in the senior leaders, and I think you can see that today. Um, and so um, people ask me also is that, did I have an issue with being a female? And um, I think I just decided that I was going to outwork everybody. And after that, if, they thought, if I, it was a problem, it wasn't a problem anymore. Um, I had probably more of an issue because I was a nurse. I have heard that I am not qualified for a job because I'm not medical corps. Well, I, I love you all, you doctors. I really do. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I believe that when you come to the senior levels or you, it's about what you know, the skill that you bring, and the passion you bring to the job. And so, um, yeah, there's been some issues, but um, I kind of ignore it, run over it, and that's what I would recommend. Be respectful while you do that. <laughs> um, but you got to know your stuff, no matter if you're a female or a male. And um, I've just been very fortunate for that. But I will tell you is that I, a lot of my mentorship, as we talked in the beginning, was with males, because that's all I had. And so um, I make myself very open to people. So um, there's a lot to talk about. So, but uh, that's a, I, I think that's two to three minutes of 32 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, General Bingham, what were some of the adversities you faced as an upcoming leader in a male dominant field? What were some of your keys to success? Well, thank you, and thank everyone for being here for the event organizers. It's great to see good friends in the audience. Um, when I think about adversity, I think about two significant emotional events that happened to me, one while I was attending school at the University of Alabama on a four-year Army ROTC scholarship, and the second time uh, when I was a promotable captain. And um, as with most college students, uh, you get there on a scholarship, you you're accustomed to studying. So my first two years, I had a very good uh, regimen. Go to class, attend class, read material, go to the library afterwards, do your homework, and, and so forth. And uh, did that for two years, had a good grade point average. And then I uh, pledged my beloved sorority and started wearing my little Greek symbols, and uh, my grades began to slip a bit. And so, um, I needed to bolster my GPA, and I went through the Rolodex and said, okay, eeny, meeny, miny, sociology 101. How hard could it be? That should be an easy A for me. So I said, I'll take sociology 101. And um, the first day of class, the professor, it was a pretty big audience, uh, kind of an auditorium similar to this. The professor spoke very quickly. And he said there would be two exams in the course. The first one would be worth 40% of my grade, and the final would be worth 60% of my grade. Well, if you are like me after the fact, that's probably not good odds, but I <laughs> stuck with it anyway. My dad said, you're not a quitter, so don't be one. 
And so the first exam I took, and I started going down multiple choice, and the first question didn't really know. Two, three, four didn't get better. I flipped it over on the back side backwards, and that didn't seem to help. So uh, I got my grade back, and I made a 60 on the exam, and that's a D. And I have never made anything less than a C ever in any of my high school, elementary school, <laughs> college. So I was shocked. So I went to the professor and uh, seeking help and asked him how I might approach my studies so that I could be prepared for the final. And what the professor said to me, I can remember as if it were yesterday, and he said these words, well, it's a known fact that people like you don't do well in education. I was stupefied, didn't see that coming, and uh, he just stared at me, didn't say anything else, and I found my blood pressure raising and raising, and I have a tendency when I get so angry, tears uh, tend to well up and, and fall, and rather than him to think I was weak, I stood up, I thanked him for his time, and I left his office. A second time happened when I was a promotable captain, and the senior leader of the command met with all the field grade officers. He said to me, Captain Bingham, and I was promotable, he says, uh, I'm sure you have great officer evaluation reports, he said, but I can just about assure you that you'll never, ever be seriously considered for battalion command. And I said, well, why do you say that, sir? And he says, you don't have enough division time. I had served in the 9th Infantry Division, and um, I was where I was. And I said, well, sir, I've gone everywhere the Army asked me to go, and I just want to assure you that I will do the best job that I can possibly do and give you 100% of my best efforts every day. So what did I learn from the first event? I learned from the professor who was really a racist that I would never, ever let someone under my charge be made to felt as if they were inferior or as if they could not achieve. From the event where the gentleman who was a general officer said to me, you'll never ever be considered for battalion command, I learned not to play God with other people's life, that there is definitely a road map, and that road map may not be the same as everyone. So if you can conceive it and believe it with hard work, perseverance, and commitment, you can achieve it. So thanks very much. Thank you, ma'am. General Keenan, the Army Nurse Corps is a pretty um, female-dominant field in the junior ranks, but as you progress in your field and your career, you kind of see more diversity. What challenges did you face um, as you became more senior, and how did you overcome them? Well, first, again, thank you for, for inviting me. You know, uh, BAMC is like a, a second second home uh, to me, and I see a lot of familiar faces. You know, the one thing that I think is important is I remember throughout my career that so many people wanted to define you by being a female or by being a nurse. And what I like to always remind everybody and especially when I would go and speak with our, uh, our students that were in Bolick, was about that we're wearing the cloth of our nation. And when you wear the cloth of our nation, the last time I looked, and I can see many uniforms out here, is that I would say, what is on the left side? And they, they would all look down and they'd say, well, it says US Army. And I said, yes. I said, first we are a soldier, then an officer, an NCO, and then we are whatever we were, you know, we were branched. In my case, a nurse. However, we all wear the cloth of our nation. And as I continued to uh, have the opportunities, and it truly was opportunities, uh, to stay and serve and take care of America's sons and daughters, uh, there were times, just as General Bingham said, that people had doubts, uh, you know, about, well, you know, where, where are you going? What is your career path? And, and again, we've always gone where the, the military's asked us to go. 
But I think probably uh, some of the biggest challenges I found is when uh, uh, in uh, 2007, uh, at, when we had uh, the, the issues at Walter Reed, where we were taking care of our, our most gravely wounded, ill, and injured service members, and I got asked to work with General Tucker to stand up the Warrior Transition Unit. And to really have to, to dig in deep uh, and go and work with, with Congress, work with mothers and fathers, and spouses with families, and, and then I think to navigate the Pentagon. Uh, and I could tell you there were many times as uh, I continued to, to be blessed uh, and be promoted, I would be the only female in the room. Uh, I, would, I would be the only medical person in the room and having to have tough conversations with, with senior leaders in our Army about what our next steps would be, whether it was with our warrior transition uh, units as we worked to stand those up, or later on when we talked, uh, when I commanded Public Health Command, and having to talk about uh, things that we had to stay focused on, when we talk about surveillance and making sure we're taking care of all of our service members, no matter where they're deployed. Um, and so I think for me, those were some of the toughest uh, times that I saw and some of those challenges. However, the one thing I always remembered was who I was there representing. And I was there representing every other uh, soldier, every other service member, and making sure that we had a voice. So many times we lose our voice or we're afraid to speak up. And I would challenge each of you, we cannot be afraid to speak up when we see something that's not right. It's the leadership shadow we cast. What we permit, we promote. Mm. And we have to make sure that when we see something that's not right, that we speak up. Mm -hmm. That's our obligation. Thank you, ma'am. And this goes to whoever, whoever wants to answer first. As you progress in the ranks, did you seek out any female or were there any female senior leaders that you looked up to? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, Jimmy said it best. When you walk into a room, you often didn't see, and, and just look at the leaderboard. You often didn't see uh, females on leaderboards. I don't know what the leaderboard looks like at BAMSI, but I know there are leaders, one at the end of this table and on the video um, that you see now. But I came in in 1981, and there just weren't a lot of women fulfilling key leadership assignments. I'll, I'll tell you when people ask me who, who was my female shero, and I instantly go back to my mom uh, who gave birth to me but also encouraged me uh, through the years and she was a devout Christian woman who uh, taught me the golden rule treat others the way that you want to be treated uh, we were going to be in church we were going to be in Sunday school vacation Bible school we, we spent a lot of time uh, in church which really enhanced my faith which is very important to me um, I have had uh, women along the way most honestly, in the latter part of my career, uh, where I've seen uh, female general officers who I have uh, had the great fortune of even either having uh, a personal relationship with or working for. I remember General Dunwoody, when I was the garrison commander at Fort Lee, was my senior, was my boss. And um, she was just so great of a, a leader when my husband I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, she really showed me what leadership is all about. Um, and I remember it was a 46th Quartermaster General who said these words, and I thought about her when he said these words to me as a bat battalion commander. He says, Bingham, uh, you can have all medals and ribbons on your chest, and that's a good thing. He says, but at the end of the day, nobody cares how much you know 
until they know how much you care. And so my definition of a great leader, be they female or male, is a person who cares for the men and women under their charge. And those are the ones who I think about when I think about women mentors and men as well. Thank you. And I would say, you know, again, my mother, uh, I think we had similar, very similar mothers. My, I am one of uh, four. Uh, my dad, they, after my twin sister and I were born, they decided, okay, we're done. We've had four girls now. Uh, but she was uh, a very strong woman, really raised us. Uh, she and our, our father, to, there wasn't anything we couldn't do. Uh, also to, to stand up for what was right. And I think they, they gave us the same lawnmower. I mean, <laughs> it, no matter what job you did, you did it well. And if you didn't do it right, you were going to go back and do it again. Mm -hmm. And that's whether it was picking peaches, mowing the yard, whatever it was, that expectation was there. So the, the, the work ethic. I think... You know, as I, as I progressed in my career, you know, I was fortunate to get exposure to uh, uh, great leaders uh, in the Army Nurse Corps, uh, uh, General Adam Zender. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just, just amazing. Uh, and, you know, she still uh, can, can uh, dress you down with a smile, <laughs> and she does. <laughs> uh, and, of course, you know, uh, General Patty Horho, I mean, what an amazing uh, leader and, and really a, a groundbreaking leader for us. Uh, you know, made tremendous differences and changes uh, to Walter Reed. Uh, and then as our, our first uh, uh, female Surgeon General, I mean, really broke that, uh, and, and non-physician, and nothing against any of the physicians in the room, but really broke that paradigm uh, so that we could see uh, uh, that be able to, to be a career path for, for, uh, for other services. Uh, and, and she continues to do that today uh, in her current role. Uh, so I would say that I had both uh, female and I had uh, male mentors, uh, too. Uh, and, you know, I learned a lot from my husband. My husband is a retired uh, Army colonel engineer. And, you know, when you think you're getting full of yourself sometimes, you need somebody there to ground you. Uh, and he was always able, uh, he's been always able to do that. He still does that today. Uh, and I think that that's important, too, is that, uh, that you know, we, we have more women mentors today. And, and I have to do a shout out for uh, General Tahan. Wow. Mm -hmm. You are very fortunate to have General Tahan. I don't know if you realize how fortunate you are to have her. Just a phenomenal, selfless leader. And uh, I was very honored uh, to have her as one of my commanders when I commanded Public Health Command. She, she always leads from the front, and it always comes from her heart. And so that, those are some of the uh, uh, examples that I think of when I think of uh, uh, mentors that I've been exposed to. So I spoke about my mom. My grandmother was a nurse, and so uh, I still have her nursing cap that she got from 1935, nice. I believe. Um, she worked in a nursing home, and so she would walk there, and she had her crisp white uniform and her cap, and she walked to work, and she would talk about her patients. I knew about her patients when she was five years old, and I knew about their families. And so um, I was either going to be a nurse or a lawyer, um, my husband never wins an argument, so I think I would have been a really good lawyer. Um, <laughs> and maybe some people on my command staff would agree that I might have been a good lawyer. Um, but then also in the nurse corps, I mean, well, all I saw was females probably, you know, all our chief nurses were females, all those kind of things. Um, I speak General Hogg, when I became an 05, 06, um, she would meet with me once a year and ask what, what the plan was and the pathway. Um, she became an Air Force uh, Surgeon General. She retired in 2021. Um, and still to this day, she will text me and go, what are you up to? What are you doing? Are you taking care of yourself? And I think you need um, not only those who are going to mentor you professionally, but who's going to mentor you personally. Because um, this job, jobs, 
um, can be overtaking and self-care and taking care of yourself is, is tough. Mm -hmm. And you need someone to kind of give you that uh, feedback that you look tired. Um, uh, what's your blood pressure today? Um, and those kind of things. And so those are, the, you need two types of people. And it also is very helpful if they are one person who's not only looking for you professionally and personally. And so a lot of times when I do mentoring, I will tell you, um, females can be very hard on themselves. You, we, we do a lot of self-reflection. We do a lot of Monday morning quarterback, all those kind of things. And I'm always like, so do you have grace with other people? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, so why don't you have grace for yourself? Um, and they'll be like, oh, I'm like, you can't be the mother, the wife, the Air Force or um, Army officer that you want to be. It, you can't balance it out. It is if you balance it, you're not elite at anything. And so I call it ruthlessly, ruthless prioritization. And some days it's going to take work, and some days it's going to take your family. And what you really need to do is the people who work around you, you need to put that into them as well. If you are work, I had one time had a commander tell me, no one wants to be you. And I was very offended by that. And he says, you're here at 4 o'clock and you're the last car. Who wants to be you? And it's true. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was probably not a great reflection of being a wife and being a mother as well. I have three daughters. I have a... Um, 29-year-old, a 28-year-old, and a 23-year-old, and I don't think I made too many errors, but I'm very fortunate that I had a husband that was very flexible, adaptable to the moves that we've done, and um, he's a great father and mother because uh, <laughs> I was not. All, and you also need to have that spouse or partner who will tell you and say, you know what, um, I haven't seen you in three days. And so is that email really that important? So it took me a long time to figure that out. And so you need to have people who will give you um, honest feedback on how you are living both sides of your life. Ma'am, that's actually a great segue into my next question. And I'll leave it up to our uh, retired general since you mostly answered the question. Um, but um, I've heard things as selfless, uh, outwork everybody, um, taking care of others. Did you find at times that you had to overwork in order to stay competitive and you lost sight of taking care of yourself and your family? I think uh, we probably all three of us sitting here can say yes uh, to that and Janine I really applaud what she said. I, I, she took me back to when I was in battalion command. Uh, I had an AIT battalion at Fort Lee, Virginia and, and loved my job, loved it. And my husband calls me one night and uh, he says, baby, do you know what time it is? And I had lost track of time, looked at my watch, it was nine o'clock. And I and my Sergeant Major were still there working. He says, baby, you really need to wrap it up and come on home. And um, so yeah, I really can appreciate the fact that uh, you get a couple things. One, when, um, when you don't see yourself on the leaderboard, you feel in uh, kind of internally that you need to do a great job in whatever job that you are assigned to. And I, rem I told you all about the two incidents that happened to me, one particular with the um, general officer saying that uh, you'll never ever become a, a battalion commander. So when someone tells you that, it makes you work hard to learn your craft, to learn it well, and to be good at what you aim to be. Now when I first came into the military though, I was on the four-year scholarship, I came in literally for four years and not a day longer. Um, oops, something <laughs> happened along the way. <laughs> I like to say I fell in love not only with the round-headed man from South Carolina, who if the Lord lets us see November will be 40 years of marriage. I fell in love with him, but I also fell in love with this vocation called the U.S. Army and I've been the better for it. And so when you love something so much, it just doesn't feel like work you really can lose yourself in that work because you know you're taking care of mostly the people who work under your charge, but also getting the mission accomplished. But there will be times though, as Janine has said, when you have to ratchet back because you also want to have that man I married 40 years ago, I want to be married to him when I retired from the military. And so we found a way to, to try to do that a little bit better. We'd have date nights on Fridays and so Fridays became our time when we were just put the mission aside and just, you know, do things together as a couple. And that seemed to work really well for us. But 
you really have to force yourself to not only take care of the people and the mission that you're assigned, but also to take care of yourself and your family. And I have two kids as well. I, you know, I, I, I reflect back on it, and, and again, I, I, I don't think maybe, uh, I don't think my kids were, were too badly uh, uh, scarred from it. I used to, to, to ask them that. It was interesting as uh, uh, dual military. My husband also served uh, 30 years, and you know there was the. I remember the the time uh, in '99 uh, when we were going into to Kosovo. I was with the 67th Combat Support Hospital, and they brought me in and said, "Okay, you're gonna uh, you'll uh, take the." hospital, you'll be the chief nurse and XO of the 67th uh, as we go in there. And I went home that night to tell my husband, who was in the 9th Legionnaire Battalion in Schweinfurt, and I said, hey, uh, I'm, I'm going to deploy. He goes, oh, I am too. Well, we had a 14-month-old, and so it was, uh, that was that family care plan. And, you know, you don't really know until you have to execute that. And you think about how many times now, how many families have had to do that over and over and over and over again. And uh, I remember we executed that care plan. I had to deploy first. And I run into his battalion commander in, a, in the chow line. And he says, so, uh, Will, your son, he's, he's going to Oregon. I went, Oregon, no, my mother-in-law, she, she's, you know, she's going to stay in Germany with him. Oh, no, no, she's not. I felt at that time, I was like, wow, I've lost all control hmm. of, you know, the, 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 you know, what's going on. So I remember getting in line, because this is before we had these. <laughs> uh, or there were some, but, you know, they were probably big or something. But, uh, and getting in this line to be able to call back to Germany, and my husband was getting ready to deploy it down. I'm like, is there something you need to tell me? Well, I don't want to distract you. I know you're busy. I said, yeah, I'm busy. But I said, where's Will going? He goes, well, you know, it didn't work out. He's going. And, you know, I, I think at that time I, I really thought, wow, what kind of parent am I? Uh, and there was always that 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 back and back and forth. Uh, but again, really realizing you've got uh, you know your family, uh, and and you've got your 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 army family too. And that there are times uh, that you know you can't say, well, I'm not I'm not going to go right. Uh, and I remember. As we, as we went in there and as we were taking care of, uh, uh, you know, amputations, all kinds of things there, and I would see these little children that had been uh, injured, I said, I know my son is being well cared for. And so you have to, you have to, to balance all of that uh, as, as you go forward. And then one of the things I learned as I, as I took command is that you, did ha you do have to model what you expect. Uh, now, sometimes did we have to work late, long hours, and be gone? Yes. However, when we could leave and go home and sit down and have dinner, I found that very important. And so, I think you have to model that uh, for your uh, for your command. Uh, and then I will tell you, uh, you know, as uh, my, my kids got older. My son is going to be 25 uh, in a couple of weeks, and our daughter's 22. Uh, you know, we would a ask, you know, what are you going to, you know, what do you want to do? And our son had always said he would have, you know, I'll, well, I've been in the Army for 18 years. I, you know, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Uh, however, he is a first lieutenant in the <laughs> infantry <laughs> uh, stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana. And uh, now, oh, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> There's no bad assignment in the army. Uh, That's true. Uh, but uh, what I, what I, I think he learned. Hopefully, he learned, and he, and he's been able to come back to us and tell us is that I, you know, I really learned from uh, you and Dad that you always made an effort to be there if, if there was like soccer game or uh, to be there for us. But when you couldn't, we understood uh, because. We were in an army family. And so I think that what we have to try to do is we have to try and model that mm -hmm. 
uh, because you do want your family to be there with you when you when you make that transition out of the military. It's uh, it because it is a change, right? Uh, but again, uh, you know, you have to take care of yourself before you take care of others. Uh, I still get up and run or exercise every day. I was at boot camp at 5:30. I actually pay now. For <laughs> And she tried to kill me this morning, along with <laughs> 10 other of my friends. Uh, but again, you have to take care of yourself uh, before you can take care of others. And you have to ha find that, one, that something you can do, whether it's meditation, breathing, exercise, something to help ground yourself every day. General Rada, did you want to add anything? Um, I think the biggest thing is I learned when I was a squadron commander and for the Air Force, it's about a unit of 160 and you have all the clinical operations. And so I, I took every 160 person very seriously in the mission ops. And so my family was probably the first time we had two in high school and one in elementary school. And uh, I would say that's the first time there was some kind of like, my husband was like, whew, this is not what I signed up to do. Just to give you a little background is that um, we started dating on Halloween, and we were married by the 28th of um, January. We were the 90-day um, fiancé before it was a reality <laughs> show. Um, I don't recommend it for anyone, but we just celebrated our 31st anniversary. <laughs> but it was the first time I came home, and he was like, you know what? I didn't sign up for this. And I had just come off, before I went into squadron, I had just come off a deployment from Afghanistan. And I will say, the person he married is not the person that came back. And so... Um, it, it scared me straight because this is not what I wanted for our marriage. Terry is the best life decision I have ever made. He is, um, was born in Fort Carson. His dad was retired Army. Um, Terry was enlisted. So he knows the mission. He understands the mission. But he, I don't think he expected that. Um, I think when I was gone for Afghanistan, between the training and the deployment, I was gone for about 10 months. Um, and I loved every minute that I was in Afghanistan. When I came back, I missed it. And I think my family was very much like, I'm a little confused by this. Um, what I also didn't realize is that um, I belonged to um, Sistika. We were flying with the Afghans. We were doing crazy stuff all the time to prove the credibility of the Afghan Air Corps. And my family worried every single day that they were gonna get a call, that I wasn't gonna come back. So while I think I'm having a great time in doing the mission, my family is worried every single day that I am not coming back. And I would send these pictures and do these things and say, you know, I, I love it here. And they probably were wondering, like, what is wrong with her? And so then I go off to command, and I have given 120% of that. And my husband was like, we got we to gotta reevaluate. And so um, I became much better at saying, when I said I was coming home, I came home. Because how many of us said, we'll be one more email and I'm coming home. <laughs> and 90 minutes later, you're like, oh, yep. I, I'm not home yet. And so I became much better at that. I also said, you know what, I have an inspect we have an inspection coming up and I have got to be at work for these long hours. But I can tell you on this date, it will get better. But I was in for 17 years before I started doing that. Mm -hmm. And so that is, a way, like, whatever you do and whatever you say, stick with it. And you know what? Your teammates, is there one person in here who wouldn't help your teammate go and see a soccer game or go see a recital? Mm -hmm. Not one person. But we have to build those cultures that people feel like they can say, I got something big and I need to be there. Or you know what? My daughter or son are not doing very well and I need to be home for dinner because we got to talk about some important stuff. Thank you, ma'am. Um, for our retired generals, now that you're in the civilian workforce, have you noticed um, a, a difference in respect or how you're viewed or how people treat you versus when you were in the military? That's a great question. Um, I, I would say I really haven't noticed necessarily a difference. Um, the fact that I'm not wearing a uniform, people still know that I'm a retired Army uh, veteran and um, I'm very proud of my service inside the military. I often have the opportunity to educate about the military and uh, take every opportunity to talk about our men and women and family members 
uh, because after all, that's what uh, got me in love and the way I fell in love for more than 38 years. And so I, I enjoy being able to tell the Army story. I, I wore my Soldier for Life uh, retirement pin, uh, and I try to wear that as often as I can because I feel like a Soldier for Life. And uh, I want people on the outside to understand what the military family does, uh, the soldiers, what they do, the sacrifices that they make. So I guess you might say I'm more of an ambassador uh, in my life uh, outside of my active duty time, uh, just telling that Army story and telling our military story so that others outside our gates in the communities, uh, one, they know uh, who we are, where we are, and what we do. And also to build partnerships, I think, are very important with our outside the gates community. So every time I get the chance to engage uh, with um, members in whether it be the corporate world or nonprofit world that I'm uh, dabbling a bit in now, uh, I love the opportunity to tell our, our service members, uh, tell our stories, and be able to continually advocate for us. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things I found because I uh, uh, went uh, into uh, really the civilian side of healthcare, and I, I, I t when I went out to to, to interview with uh, different organizations, I said, "You got to give me something that gets me excited to get up in the morning." I had the best job for for 30 years. I took care of America's sons and daughters. Can you top that? <laughs> and. And uh, the organization that I work for is a very large medical group. We're also part of uh, Optum and United Health Group. And what really drew me is to the, their mission and to their values and value-based care. And uh, when you think about the uh, five values that, that we have, which is integrity, compassion, relationship, uh, innovation, and performance, really being able to wrap uh, those up and understand that people were, were actually doing that, that they were following those values got me very excited. Uh, the other thing that I was very uh, passionate about is helping uh, others transition from the, the military, whether they served their initial obligation or uh, they were retiring. And so uh, this gave me the opportunity to uh, uh, to actually work uh, with hiring our heroes, and then uh, to to actually help establish with United Health Group uh, our program where uh, we hire uh, transitioning uh, military members. Uh, they do a six-month inter internship fellowship uh, with United Health Group, and uh, get to learn what it's going to be like. Uh, so you get to kind of test drive. Uh, the organization, and they, and they get to see, you know, if you'd be a fit or not. And I'm very proud of our organization. Uh, we've had over 100 uh, 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 veterans uh, that have gone through the fellowship, and we've hired over 90% of them into permanent positions. I think that that's important because it's not easy. Everybody says, well, what's the hardest thing about transitioning? And one of the hardest things for me is I really like being able to wear – the boots and the <laughs> uniform, and I didn't have to carry a purse or, you know, worry about do I have shoes, do I have to what match something. I mean, it, you know, I, I really, I loved wearing the uniform. I loved being a soldier. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I thought we had a lot of acronyms. I think that was one of the hardest things I had uh, to learn is uh, new acronyms when, when I, I moved into my uh, uh, position. Uh, I. I think the other thing that was great about transitioning is being able to then volunteer more to uh, serve on uh, not-for-profit uh, boards, and I, that is another passion that I've, I've been able to, uh, to, to do uh, here uh, in uh, San Antonio. Uh, it's so important to be able to give back. Um, and so for me, uh, being able to, to help those that are transitioning uh, from the military to be able to uh, uh, participate here in the community and, and give back to uh, Military City USA, who has given so much to all of us, uh, has really been uh, my uh, uh, passion. Do they know that I, that I, I served? Yes. And, you know, what's interesting is when I, we 
we hire people that I've served with, and I have to say, no, you, you, don't, you don't call me general, no, it's Jimmy. And so I, that, and, and they're like, and I'm like, no, no, this, you know, we, we've transitioned. Uh, but again, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it takes a little, little time uh, to do that, but I think that that's important is that we help each other uh, to, to, to transition uh, because uh, there, is, there is life after uh, the military, uh, but I can tell you that, you know, I was at an event with, uh, with, with uh, Joe on Monday night uh, and, you know, being able to stand and, and sing the Army song and, and do, it, it really, uh, you stand a little straighter, uh, you know, all those things, you, you don't forget your military service. And so, to me, being able to give back, uh, being able to support the community and, and those around us, uh, you know, I'm still excited to get up every day. Uh, I have a great job uh, that allows me to, to, to give back, uh, but you gotta find that passion, the thing that gets you excited to get up in the morning. Uh, because, like I said, I had the best job for 30 years. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Do we have any audience, audience members who want to ask any questions? This one. Yes, ma'am. I'll be brave and ask the first question. Um, you, we've touched on it a little bit already, but uh, and there's a quote where someone was asking a senior woman, you know, as a man, what can I do to support uh, the career? And, and whoever this person was, I don't recall, said the laundry. And I think some of you have gotten at this at home already with the support at home that you've had from partners and spouses. But in the workplace, what do you think are the key things that um, as far as he for she, the, our male coworkers can do to support the careers of women as we advance in our leadership roles. Well, I, I would say the first thing is um, listen. I mean, just give equal and fair equitability for people to listen. I always say there's, um, as I've matured, uh, Listening has always been a little bit hard. I'm a problem solver, so you'll be talking, and I'm solving your problem as you are talking. Um, I learned from my daughter, Paige, who told me one time, she says, I am not looking for you to solve my problem. I am just trying to vent, so stop thinking and listen to me. And so I think it's just about opening your aperture, understanding that everybody has the opportunity to lead. Um, that we are a multidisciplinary team no matter what career field, but especially in regards to the medical career field. It takes an entire team to ensure that we have great patient outcomes, that we're a ready force, and that our force is ready. And so um, I don't know, I, I always say the standards should be always high for everybody. I also think honest feedback is good. Um, I have had um, a male tell me that he didn't want to tell me something negative because he thought I would cry. And I was like, please, I played rugby in college. Like, I, I, I'm not gonna cry. Um, <laughs> but there, like, whatever, I don't, you know, I don't know if people have, whatever your conscious biases, your unconscious biases, whatever those are, just know that everybody has something to bring to the table and to listen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would, I would say listening is probably the skill that that most people don't practice enough. And what I have found is with my uh, male uh, coworkers, uh, with my, my, my bosses, is I talk to them a lot about uh, uh, equality, about equity, and you know, really understanding what equity is. Equity is really making sure that we're getting everyone equal to the same playing field, right? And not to treat anyone any differently. That we all, we all want to be treated fairly, we all want to be paid fairly. Uh, and you know, that's one of the things that I've seen in my seven years in the civilian sector is uh, there are still pay disparities and based on the work 
uh, that, that we're asking two people with the, with the same uh, job title to do. We have to address those. And, and to get to that equity, uh, we, have to, we have to be there. We have to be that voice working together uh, to, to really uh, level that, that playing field. When I took command of White Sands Missile Range, I was the first woman to have that position. Very humble and grateful for the opportunity. Uh, it was about 22 months that I served, and we then had our change of command ceremony afterwards. And I was standing in the receiving line, uh, shaking people's hands as they came to congratulate me. And this gentleman stopped me in the receiving line. He says, ma'am, I just need to get something off my chest. He says, when I first heard you were coming to command White Sands, I didn't like it, and I didn't like it one bit. I didn't like it because you were a woman. I know, I know, I shouldn't have felt that way, but I just want to let you know that since you've been here, you've been one of the best commanders we've ever had. And I just want to say, shake your hand and say thank you for a job well done. And I reached up in my Alabama way and hugged his neck and thanked him for his candor. And we went off uh, our very ways feeling good about what he had said and I think how I had been received by him. Who all in this room has daughters, parents of daughters? Raise your hand. Lots of folks, 80% of the room. If you think about it, I often talk about the golden rule, treat people the same way that you want to be treated. And do you want to see someone limit the aspirations of your own daughters? I think not. And so if you come to the table or come to the thought of, I want pe to people to have the opportunity to grow and to strengthen and to be able to contribute to the team, it really sort of orders your steps and it gives you a different frame of reference. And so the next time that you see someone who's treating a woman differently than their male counterpart, just think about the daughters that we all have and, and how you would want them to be able to really thrive and to be a part of the team. I, I often ask that question and it really sort of makes us all think differently if we want to see our daughters be able to live, grow, and to thrive as our nation's citizens and the next generation. So just something to think about. There was a question here. Um, she was when she was the commander of um, public health command. Um, I did um, Brigadier General Tehan was my commander. I was her admin assistant. And I remember back then, General Harho was the Surgeon General. Our leaderboard, when you talk about leaderboards, mm -hmm. there was General Harho, there was Command Sergeant Major Brock, and there was Danger Tehan. I specifically took a picture. I remember I, I just got rid of my flip phone, so I was excited. <laughs> I took a picture and I posted it on my timeline. It comes up on my timeline. And I specifically said, Take a look at this board. This is an awesome board. It was, I've been very blessed in my military career and my um, DOD civilian career to come across women trailblazers. And um, I remember when um, Senator Clinton was um, nominated for president and they kept saying, glass ceiling, glass ceiling. And I thought to myself, women have been breaking the glass ceiling for a long time. It's just that people don't know about it. And um, I do, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you continue to do. I think it's very important that you continue to speak for our younger children. My daughters are 38 and 36. So you have these younger children, these younger soldiers that, that are out here that are being inspired by you. And I just want to say thank you very much for what you've done and what you continue to do. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm probably loud enough. <laughs>
Um, and so my question for you ladies is, as you three have progressed through the ranks into senior military leadership as females, and you've each effectively broken the glass ceiling, how do you feel like you have paved the way for other females to come behind you? It's a great question. I think people need to be able to see themselves. I'm often told that. And so when we talk about the leaderboard, and, and thank you for your comment, so when people see that others who look like them have been successful, it inspires them to, to, do, to dare to dream and to dream big and to hopefully aspire to that which they want to, to do. And so uh, just, it, it, you know, I'm very humble, as I'm sure all of us sitting here are very humbled and grateful for the opportunities. I look in the audience, I see General Brooks here, who has been a mentor for such a long time, Karen Twitty, her husband, Steph, and Karen, my sorority sister, just to name a few, who have encouraged me along the way. Sometimes that uh, journey gets tough, uh, but you have to surround yourself with people who encourage you, because um, I tell people to be judicious in the words that you use, because words matter. And words can either be used to encourage, and words can be used to discourage someone. So I personally try to, um, yeah, I hope my audio matches my video, in that what I tell someone else, I'm willing to do and am doing myself. But uh, I give thanks to God every single day, my, my husband, my family, and those many, many mentors and supporters out there who have uh, helped me along the way because you cannot do it by yourself lest you fool yourself. So I'm very grateful and, and give honor to those who have helped pave the way even for us to be sitting here on this panel today because there was someone else that uh, came before us that was a woman who was the first uh, in, her kind, in her time. And so I never want to forget that uh, to be able to reach back and give back so that someone else coming along can also aspire to achieve their best self. You know, I, I, I think a lot of it uh, is, is truly around, again, making sure that it, it's really, it, it does, you, you, you heard, you know, it takes a village. And, and I think about, I would have never gotten where, where, where I am today without the support. Again, you know, I talked about my family, I, uh, my faith, uh, just people that would come and, and, and say, you know, you can do this. Uh, because there were times that, you know, there's times that it, it's hard. Uh, but you have to, to reach deep inside and you can't be afraid to say, I don't know, and I need help. And I think some people think, you know, you just sort of kind of wake up one day and, you know, there's like a, a star on your uniform or something. Uh, you, you got there because other people helped you. And that, to me, is the most important thing is to remember, don't be afraid to say, I need help, and, and to be a human. Because it's that, that, that human side of us that I think uh, really helps others see, I can do this too. And then also, don't be afraid to say, I made a mistake. Because I, I can honestly tell you, I don't know about, I have made lots of, of mistakes. But as a, as, as a general officer, being able to say, I made a mistake, You've got to be able to, to, to call yourself out. Uh, but again, don't be afraid to say, I don't know, I need help, or I made a mistake. I would say, um, so when I was at Keesler, that was the first time there was a female and a nurse corps officer as that medical center commander. And so um, my boss, she would make a big deal about it. And one time I was like, please stop, you know, because I felt uncomfortable about it. I never wanted it to be about me because it's not about me. I always say I'm really not that big of a deal. And, um, and she said, but people need to see the journey. And I said, but I don't think we need to talk about it in every forum that I am in. 
Um, and I don't think I realized what a big deal is because someone said, I can't, um, when you leave, then there's another picture. There's this kind of drawing and it's the worst picture ever. Like I hate that picture. And um, I would get selfies with that picture all the time. What people that said, I, I could, we could be you someday. And then um, I went to the 7 11th and it was kind of the same thing. And, um, but it does make me uncomfortable because it's really not about me. Um, General Travis, who was the SG in 2015 for the Air Force, um, it used to be very core centric to how senior jobs were made. And he said, we're not gonna do that anymore. It's gonna be the best qualified person, the best leader. And so I'm just very fortunate that the rules changed because ten, um, I never imagined in a million years that I would be the 59th Medical Wing Commander. As a matter of fact, up until the week I was told I was going to be the 59th Medical Wing Commander, I never imagined that I was gonna be the 59th Medical Wing um, Commander. One of the things I talk about when I give leadership talks is that um, don't be afraid to say you're sorry. Don't be afraid to change your mind. Um, sometimes you make the best decision you can with the information you have, and three days later, you, you can change. Um, one time, one of my executive staff said, you've apologized three times today. And I was like, because I made three mistakes. And so if I can't admit that I made a mistake, then how do we expect the medics who are around us to um, admit that they made a mistake? It's very hard to say, you know what, I didn't get that right. What I usually think is anybody who comes into our medical treatment facilities, there's something, it is either the training, the education, the process, or the systems that come. But if they think they're, um, they can't admit a mistake, then we're not gonna figure out that there's something wrong with those four things. Um, also, I will tell you right now, um, and people find very, this is the most challenging job that I have ever had. Um, depending on what day and what hat, my three three-star bosses, their priorities could be conflicting. And so, um, and I have, and someone said, I don't think you're supposed to admit that when you're a general officer. And I was like, <laughs> I admit that every day. And so I think you have to be, still be a person and that you have struggles and you have challenges and you have all those things. And so it is great to have glass ceilings, but there's challenge, it's, it's not easy, it was not easy to get here. Um, but I'm just very fortunate that um, people mentored, they counseled me, people did give me feedback and I didn't cry. Um, and that um, people felt that I was worth investing. And so the other thing is, is that I expect all the chief nurses that are within the Air Force that they are going to counsel and mentor their people. And so I do that as well. If I'm in town, I do two to four um, counsels any time, whatever time zone, to help the nurses or anyone, any core, um, be better because we have to put ourselves out there and we have to be. And so someone said, oh my gosh, you're a real person. And I was <laughs> like, I am, you know? And, um, and I think that, that you, we are real people that we really um, take everything that you all do. The magic does not happen with me. It does not happen in my command suite. It, does, it happens with all of you. You are the ones who are working hard to get the mission. And so I think I don't really take myself that seriously. Um, I take what I do seriously, but not myself seriously. Thank you all so much for answering all the questions. As we wrap up, would you like to give any final thoughts? Do you want me to say? Yeah, please. <laughs> we always make, we, we, we defer to deference. <laughs> um, so what I want to say to everyone, thank you for your service. You know, um, there is multiple places that your expertise, leadership, clinical expertise, everything, where you could serve. Um, I am, why I serve is because of the mission. We take care of the nation's sons and daughters, and in the locations like this, their grandparents. And so it is a hard job. It has been the, the toughest three years that any of us, and I would say within San Antonio, you really have knocked it out of the park. When you talk about COVID, testing, vaccinations, going out to civilian networks, um, deploying in whatever that we have to, MHS Genesis, <laughs> all of those things, um, you have done that and you have been leading the way within the Defense Health Agency, the military health system and you have always made sure that we have a ready force and a ready medics, and it is nothing but an honor to serve with every single one of you. I, I just wanna express gratitude uh, again, uh, just to the point of thinking where we've come from over the last, uh, since 2020, March of 2020, 
uh, with, with, uh, with COVID, uh, being able to continue to, to, to care, to support uh, all of our forces around the world. Uh, again, you all didn't miss a beat. Uh, and I, when I think back, uh, you know, to that care that you give, uh, it really grounds me uh, when I, I, I know the, the care that you give my family and that you give now my son and his wife uh, because, you know, it's a little different when you look at it from that perspective that, you know, now, now it's, uh, your child is wearing the cloth uh, and you've stepped back. Uh, so, again, I just want to give my gratitude to each and every one of you and thank you for your continued service uh, to our nation. I too echo my thanks uh, to all of you here uh, in the room and, and on net. Um, my four years morphed into 38 years because of the people who I fell in love with throughout the military, and I'm so grateful. Uh, thank you for uh, honoring uh, your, your military retiree veterans. Uh, this morning I had the great fortune to um, administer the oath to Specialist Andrews. I'll ask her to stand up, not to embarrass you, but to uh, honor you and thank you for three more good years. <laughs> what a joy. And um, when I came, uh, my father is a medic, Army medic, was an Army medic before he passed away. 20 years, he retired here at Bamsey Parade Field. And um, when I came out of the military, retired, I, I drove in with my hubby on a Sunday and by Monday night or Monday morning, I was in the emergency room here at Brook Army Medical Center in need of an uh, emergency appendectomy. So I thank all the health care providers here uh, for taking good care of me. If you would uh, indulge me, I'd like for each of you to look at the person to your left and right. Look them in their beady eyes and say these words to them. You ready? I need you. And you need me. And you need me. Turn to your neighbor on the other side and say, we need each other. We need each other. <laughs> Give yourselves a hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We will now have General Retired Brooks and Colonel Retired Benning would like to present you with a uh, gift. Ladies, I don't know about anyone else, but I personally am so full of the knowledge and the honesty and the candor of the information that you provided us today. Uh, as a recently retired colonel in the United States Army, 28 years, the stories that you told just kind of weaved into my heart, just different experiences that I've had myself. And so I know on behalf of every woman that's in the room, either in uniform or not, has been completely encouraged. But not only just the women in the room, I'm hoping that some of the gentlemen, all of the gentlemen in the room have been able to glean from what they have brought to the table today and the path that they have set for all because they didn't just lead women. They led all of us and they continue to do so today. So from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate that. On behalf of the Alamo chapter, Rocks Incorporated for San Antonio, and also from Bamsey, the folks in the room and the folks online, we would like to present to you just a small token of our appreciation for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. I certainly uh, 
am also awed by what I heard today. And what a, what a story of service it came from each one of these generals. And what an inspiration for every one of us. So uh, first, thanks to BAMC and thanks to the Rocks for pulling this together at the Alamo chapter. And thanks to all of you for turning out to, to hear this story, uh, these stories. We can't help but walk away from here knowing that we are in great hands and that these trailblazers have made it possible. We are so much better now than we were before their presence rose them into these senior ranks. But now we have to take it forward. So thanks to each one of you for, for sharing what you shared. Thanks for sharing your years of service with our nation and your continued contributions that you make. It's an honor and a blessing to be with each, one, each and every one of you. Thanks very much. Thank you, ladies. We're going to have closing remarks by Major Lyons Watson. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Major Leticia Lyons Watson, and I am the flight commander of gynecologic surgery and obstetrics here at BMC. And I'm also the chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee here at BMC as well. And the only word that comes to mind is wow. Um, this was an amazing event. Um, I think we are all witnessing or a part of a very rare opportunity to be in the presence of such distinguished women um, who have served the military well. And um, I just told Colonel here that she took all my words because that's what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I too am full and I hope that everyone here is full as well. And to our distinguished panel, thank you so very much for your time and your service here. Thank you. I also wanted to thank our partners in, who helped put this event together, um, the DEI committee, as I mentioned before, as well as BMC's Equal Opportunity Office, and of course, the San Antonio chapter of The Rocks Incorporated. Thank you all so very much. And lastly, a uh, big thank you to Captain Tolbert for organizing this whole event behind the scenes. She has really been amazing. So um, again, this has been wonderful, and um, I'm so glad that everyone has come out to be a part of this very special event. Thank you. This concludes the event. Thank you all for attending.